Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast. I'm Josh, and I am here in Limassol, Cyprus, with my friend Tara Merck. Tara is a student, a PhD student with Primavera de Filippi. She's affiliated with the Weizenbaum Institute, uh, Blockchain Gov, uh, Other Internet, and a few other things. Did I get all of them? Metagov. And Metagov. I knew I was missing one. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Tara is, uh, has been working on some pretty cool research, um, in- including uh, Exit to Community, which was an idea that was brought forth by, uh, I believe it was Nathan Schneider um, a few years ago, uh, which I've talked about on the podcast before, but I think I'll let Tara speak that, about that more. And then she's also recently published a piece uh, of research with other internets that's focusing on, I guess, working conditions in Web3 and um, kind of the, the, uh, the issues with that at the moment and what are some suggestions in, in improving it. So, hi Tara, <laughs> how are you? I'm good, thanks for <laughs> having me here. <laughs> of course, and how did you, um, yeah, we were, we've been in Money Lab. Um, this is why we're, we're in Cyprus, which is uh, uh, the events started by Geert Lovink. Um, but yeah, and you were able to uh, uh, show some of your research and your work and your presentation was really nice, but uh, how are you enjoying? <laughs> Cyprus. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm very glad I got to come to Money Lab. Uh, first of all, of course, for the interesting conversations and topics brought up there, um, and secondly, to get out of the grey Berlin winter <laughs> into <laughs> the sunny Mediterranean climate. Yeah. Uh. Um, so maybe to start, would you want to, if you want to give kind of like a, an introduction to your work on exit to community, and then we can go from there. Yeah. Um, sure. So. Exit to community is kind of like the the topic that I chose uh, for my thesis, and maybe like it was fun going into this PhD. That at the beginning I had a a bunch of different ideas sketched out, and you have to apply with a research proposal and whatnot. And pretty much in my first week, um, Primavera just sat me down, and she was like, um, "Yeah, but what's your cause?" Uh, <laughs> mm. And I said, "Well, I don't know, but this is a really interesting research topic." And she said, "No, no, no. Like, what's your cause?" Um, and she sent me a way to go um, meditate or do whatever I had to do, <laughs> is what she said, to to go and find that and. Essentially, a bunch of things came together from like my own uh, past experience, but also working closely with Morshed Manan, who's a postdoc in the Blockchain Gov. Friend of um, the podcast. Friend of the podcast, <laughs> friend of ours, um, uh, who's working as a postdoc on that project. And he did his PhD thesis on the emergence of cooperative uh, firms in the platform economy. Um, so this was already, and he he wrote uh, one of the the major sort of academic pieces together with Nathan Schneider around exit to community and three legal strategies or pathways in which a hypothetical company could do it. So I got very interested in that, and it connected to a lot of like previous experience that I had working in social startups and um, you know being fed up with this sort of the way that big platforms are using my data. As a German, I'm very concerned <laughs> about my privacy. Um, you know, or any any anybody um, in touch with the internet should be, um, and and kind of settled on that. And uh, so my thesis explores this idea of exit to community and uh, tries to further it as a concept and our understanding of like how do we go about uh, exiting to community? Maybe as a introduction here, what does exit to community refer to? Um, in its most basic form, uh, it's about transitioning founder and investor-led startups. So, you know, the the sort of status quo model that we see, especially in the in the tech industry. Um, how do we transition that into something that is community owned and governed at a later stage? Um, exit meaning that both the founder relinquishes ownership and control over the project, um, as well as the investor is sort of uh, doing the same thing and and leaving that ownership and control to stakeholders that are in some way a community that means they are connected to this product service platform uh, specifically in my context um, that it's all about this organization and they also have some sort of emotional bond you know amongst each other they they're probably not just customers of mm. of a business but yeah take on the stewardship role 
Um, so that's what it's about. Um, I try to understand why is this important. That's maybe the, the most pressing thing. And then uh, obviously maybe I'm biased, but I try to <laughs> make a reasoned argument for why it is go in the second step to explore how do you practically do it? Like what are what are strategies that um, projects and organizations currently in that transition phase are employing in terms of governance, in terms of communications, in terms of setting up labor policies for the outcome of an exit to community, et cetera, um, to, yeah, ideally have like something that others can refer to um, right, right. going forward. So well, the way that I um, have read about exit to community is, I mean, at least in the, uh, context of like tech startups is usually that you have more or less two choices as an investor of uh, or a, start, a founder of like a company is either you sell it to a bigger player uh, with more money or you IPO uh, and enrich sort of like the investors through through a public offering. Um, and so like this means that your only two choices are really to give in to big capital to to a wide extent and there isn't much uh so exit community is to provide a third option where instead you can give it to give the ownership to those who um actually use the product or actually care about about it uh which is of course like a really interesting kind of mid mid ground between you know just going all in on tech startup sort of mentality versus trying the pretty difficult job of having like a purely horizontal cooperative uh, compete with a tech startup, which has much many more resources. So it's kind of like a, like a middle ground. Yeah, exactly. So this is also like in my sort of exploring and uh, grappling with this idea of exit to community. That's a lot how I understood it as well. Also historically. So there's, um, there's these there's this discontent with our uh, tech platforms. So like staying with the tech industry, um, that as I said is around the use of data. It is around the fact that um, platform corporations sort of uh, have a say on how algorithms are structured, which sometimes is detrimental to content creators or whoever. Um, there's a, a really big sort of issue around working conditions in the gig economy. Previously, you know, mm. masked as something like the sharing economy. Um, especially in countries that don't have, you know, strong worker protections or governments uh, regulating around these workers, um, that, that people really get exploited as Uber drivers, as click workers, as yeah. um, what have you. Um, and another aspect also being a realization that over the past few years, we're having a very hard time from, uh, from a national government perspective to hold these platforms accountable to what we're asking them to do. And it starts with paying taxes, you know, goes on to, um, to regulating fake news that is spread, etc., um, and all of these things are recognized not just by people who are trying to advance uh, exit to community, but was also something that was very much picked up by the platform cooperativism movement. Mm -hmm. And the solution here um, was to say, OK, but then why don't we just replicate the sort of function of some of the platforms that we know today but instead of starting them um, with a corporation sort of building out the platform we're going to go straight into the uh, cooperative model where you know a ride sharing platform would be owned by the drivers and the users and the developers uh, etc i think the issue that we've seen here is that uh Building these tech platforms as a community-owned and governed organization from the start means that in the beginning, early stages, you're you're moving a lot slower than if you have this sort of top-down um, uh, kind of leadership that many, many startup companies do. You're moving a lot slower. It is way more difficult for you to attract uh, external capital um, to to build the market on your platform, et cetera, et cetera. So that even though we have so many successful and like wonderful platform co-ops out there, uh, they have not yet become like a, a really serious competition to the big tech platforms um, that right. we're still using today. And exit to community is kind of like, that's how I understand it, a pragmatic approach to that, which says, okay, in the beginning, we're going to do that sort of uh, tech startup model and we're going to have the founders who can pivot and bring in internal and external investors and et cetera and build out and scale like uh, a platform to a certain size. However, the goal here um, 
as we mentioned, and the, the difference is to build in safeguards that will uh, ensure that at a later stage it is not brought to the to the uh, to an IPO or just you know swallowed up by by Facebook and and Google right, and the right. likes. Yeah. And I guess <clears throat> beyond the tech sort of industry, you can also think of it as a way for um, businesses that are maybe where the owners are becoming too old or uh, they are wanting to to sell or something like that to. Uh, offer them a way to give that company to maybe the workers or to other people who are giving up since a lot of boomers are uh, getting too old to keep running their businesses. <laughs> yeah, so so this is exactly, this is a really interesting backdrop that is happening outside of the digital platform space where especially in Western economies where we're facing this problem that's called the succession problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, where there's all these small and medium-sized businesses that are providing a real service of value to a specific community. It could be, you know, a local bakery. It could be mm. um, a GP office. This is a very uh, a big example in Germany, for example, that are just owned and led by the the, the doctor, mm. um, and they're retiring, and they they don't have uh, maybe they don't have kids who are also doctors who want to take this <laughs> on. Um, they're not like uh, a business that external, you know, or like any, any steward sort of would be able or want to buy out. They're not going to go to the public market. And what we're seeing, for example, to stick with this example of healthcare in Germany is that they're being bought up by, by big, um, Mm. already public sort of corporations where, uh, it's a really, uh, a tricky thing because the, the key purpose of any doctor's office is to provide healthcare services, right, to their patients. However, being bought up by these big um, shareholder-led uh, uh, companies that are often publicly traded, uh, the main purpose becomes to Make a increase that shareholder value exactly. And we're already seeing a decrease in in sort of public health services and and that sort of thing. And this is a trend that's going to increase. And we're seeing that, for example, in the EU or also in, in Germany, my sort of local context, uh, regulators are going against it. In Germany, they're going to implement a new type of corporate form that you know is about to go into the legislative procedure. Um, that is really about providing a standardized model for these small, medium-sized businesses to transition into that do not require the workforce or the stewards to necessarily become the owners, but by splitting ownership and governance rights, somebody else can provide the capital, they'll have some revenue share, but the purpose and the stewardship and the governance of these organizations will be led by the people who are close um, to the company. So I, mm. we're seeing a lot of like regulatory things happening both online and offline. And it's just like a, an interesting model across uh, sectors of the economy to uh, be watching right now. Right. I think we're potentially seeing just like, yeah, the further consolidation of like most businesses into already large ones that can be, of course, very problematic into the future. Um, and so there is a need for some sort of alternative to, to prevent that. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And to, you know, serve a purpose, that purpose, whatever that purpose is that that business, you know, has been catering to, uh, that needs to be maintained um, mm-hmm. and and not sort of be swallowed by a higher purpose that is, you know, to increase a profit for some external shareholder who has nothing potentially to do uh, right. or care about the, the, the actual thing that is being sold. Right, right. Um, so uh, you've been doing, of course with this research kind of making connections with the crypto space because there are a lot of connections um do you want to kind of like outline maybe why why does exit to community matter to people or why what what does crypto bring to exit to community um that makes it interesting um yeah so i mean for myself it was a natural move i've just been like in that space Pre PhD. Sure. Yeah. Also, just to say, you've been in like crypto, I think, longer than me, because <laughs> I'm being part I feel of the like Bitcoin we've had, space. Like, similar, maybe? maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> but you tell me. I remember you told me that you were like, um, you know, going to Bitcoin meetups in in Germany. Uh, I think probably before before even I was uh, doing that type of stuff. I mean, I'm not sure. I came across Bitcoin in, I think. Late 2015, early 2016. Yeah. Um, oh, look at you yeah. Or something. And then, but I mean, I wasn't taking that very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, maybe like 
towards the end of 2016 was like first encounters at Bitcoin meetups when nobody was talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I kind of like stuck with a weird hobby. Anyway, so in that sense, <laughs> it was like a natural uh, connection to to really try and make as the PhD mm -hmm. came is like, where's my cause? It is community owned uh, and stewarded organizations. Uh, how can we do that with crypto? Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately I started my PhD in a time of uh, DAO booms. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a really interesting phenomenon. And that was actually before, you know, this exit to community did emerge as my main theme. It was, it was already DAOs that uh, I thought were like mm. a very interesting phenomenon before that, you know, I also like the governance aspect of, of blockchains was already topic of my master's thesis and like mm. uh, a question that had been accompanying me uh, or like to refer to your book terms. I think I fall into the third part of like blockchain as coordination right. <laughs> <laughs> type of mapping. Um, and so, so the question of like, why is, is, Web3, like an interesting space to to uh, observe and study when we're thinking about exit to community. For me, there's like three main reasons. Um, the first one is the social norms that we have in Web3, which uh, at least myself, sometimes I just take for granted uh, this idea that decentralization is a really great thing. Um, and, you know, you'll say that at a crypto conference and everybody's like, yeah, of course, like, what are right. you talking about? <laughs> and this is just not normal. I think in, in many other industries, it's first of all, maybe just not a topic right. of conversation. Like people don't think about decentralization obsessively right. in all other walks of life. Um, right. We do. And we all agree uh, despite our, you know, organizations being very different and their aims like super diverse uh, from the regions to the degens and whoever else, everybody's like, yeah, decentralization. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing, which in itself is a social norm that encourages this idea of sort of, uh, or like at least is not opposed to the idea of community ownership and governance already with the, you know, right. um, one validator, one node sort of right, right. Uh, vote model. Uh, so the social norms is the first one. The second one was kind of this question a little bit of like, when we do exit uh, big uh, digital platforms to something that is community owned and governed, there's a practical concern that is for me like, oh, but you know, like then what sort of entity would that become? Like is that going to be this new entity type in Germany? Um, mm. Are you as a U.S. citizen going to be able to become a steward of that? Is it going to be a U.S.-based cooperative? Is Europe going to be happy with the sort of data protection laws that that co-op implements? Is there mm. um, so, so this weird thing that we've created platforms that are super international, global, like very much beyond the nation state, but they uh, are attached to organizations incorporated in a specific jurisdiction, just seems a little bit at odds. So uh, I think the way that I like to think about it, it would be really cool that if you exit to community, uh, a global digital platform, um, it should be incorporated uh, on the internet is where we, we come together and use right. it, right? Uh, and DAO is very much uh, corresponding to that idea, you know, of like an organization incorporated on the blockchain first mm -hmm. and foremost. And then, of course, we're attaching various uh, national legal... legal or exactly. Um, but already with like the, the Koala DAO model law, right, that approach of saying like, maybe you don't have to incorporate a legal wrapper in any specific jurisdiction. Maybe your DAO just needs to be structured in a specific way so that national legislation um, can recognize it as a type of organization that would be incorporated. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very interesting. <clears throat> and it's also, you know, interesting then to understand tokens as sort of cooperative shares or what have you, like just the the medium of a token as something that represents ownership and governance, right, in a specific organization, as opposed to, you know, um, a, a bureaucratic sort of like traditional uh, um, equity uh, agreement. And then uh, the last thing that I also thought was interesting, at least, you know, before this uh, crypto winter or bear market or whatever, uh, it was the, the thing that investors in Web3 were very much on board with uh, organizations progressively decentralizing, as I think uh, Andreessen Horowitz kind of almost coined that term. Um, and they were like, 
pushing pushing for this movement towards Daoification of everything. Of course, this is maybe not out of uh, not. Don't think they're evil per se, but you know, there's also a. a I do. <laughs> <laughs> there's also a clear uh, self interest in terms of the regulatory concern, yeah, yeah. right? That if your project is sufficiently decentralized, it gets exempt right. from all sorts of right, security yeah. regulations. They use prog- progressive, literally progressive language to kind of like benefit their bottom line. Uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. So it's um, it's sort of like making sure that you're not getting into murky regulation right, right. <clears throat> while also, and this I think is important to point out, just by have like creating a DAO and dropping a bunch of governance tokens to anybody who's used the protocol plus early team plus investors in many, many cases is not an exit to community because right. it very much does not represent this idea of relinquishing ownership and control, like right. cashing out. Um, it's just, it, you know, it's adding a liquidity event. Yeah. It's an so, IPO deluxe. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very strange. Um, so, exactly. Um, so, the, yeah, those are kind of the three reasons why I think it's it's interesting to be thinking um, about Exit to Community in Web3 in regards to digital platforms. Right. Uh, to, 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 the, to the first point about, like, the social expectations, uh, that's interesting because, like, yeah... Uh, it's like you don't you don't even have to like pretend to be I don't know left wing or on the social or like a socialist or anything to be like uh yeah workers should own you know or like or like the community should own like the businesses or should own like uh um have a fair share or governance around like what we do with our resources and things like that so it's been like a it's always really interesting to to talk to ostensibly very libertarian very free market oriented people or people who believe that they are that, uh, but then also talk about, like, worker ownership. Yeah, like, it is not a contradiction <laughs> it, in our space. <laughs> yeah, it's really, and it's, and, yeah, it's just a super weird thing that, like, uh, is often missed. <laughs> yeah. Rather than, like, I think Exit to Community also represents, I think, uh, 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 an attempt at kind of um, uh, guiding, guiding those um, uh, intuitions, I guess, of, of, of those types of people towards, like, probably what they would rather have than sort of like an Anderson Horowitz, you know, progressive decentralization type of uh, scenario. Because I think there's been a lot of like um, uh, disillusionment within the crypto space. And my feeling uh, is that a lot has to do with it with the influence of venture capital um, and people just like not really taking it seriously as like uh, a problem. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. I think one other thing that like with this influence, so I'm I'm not sure any, like this is my personal perspective on it, but um, the problem is that the venture capital model in crypto is still such that if you invest and have ownership, economic ownership in a project, it also means you have governance, right? Right. Like governance and a say uh, around how that project works. Uh, and this sort of meshing together of economic power and political power when it comes to protocols and organizations is a very, it's a strange thing. And then, of course, it's easy to say, you know, uh, the VC influence, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen some, you know, um, weird phenomenon where VCs will delegate their governance tokens mm-hmm. to like various university right. uh, blockchain organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of like saying, I don't. I don't want to um, right, right. be messing up this governance. like. But just also by the way that our tokens work right now, uh, if it was pure equity, then again, we're falling into a different regulatory terrain. If it is meshed, meshed up, it's, you know, is it a security token or a utility token? Well, governance tokens right now feel to people a little bit like both. Um, mm. So yeah, we're, we're having this... Uh, this this strange muddling of things that both creates a skepticism on the side of the community of outsized influence from the investors. Maybe investors don't even want that outsized influence in all cases. Governance is also a lot of work, right? Like somebody needs to keep up with all the the crazy forums and um, and and then it's transparent, so people are going to know your opinion. So I think I think it's a very uh, it's a strange situation that we're in, where a lot could maybe change if we were able to separate this idea of like yes, you know, you helped start this organization, you have a right to some revenue share, um, 
mm-hmm. maybe in a capped way. It's not going to be uh, 100x overnight. But just because you gave money does not mean you get to say uh, right. where this project is going. And this, right. so this, for example, uh, you can structure in in traditional legal organizations. And it's also something that, for example, Open Collective is an organization I'm working with right now. They very uh, consciously did in when they were raising venture capital for Open Collective, the the founders said, you know, we're going to keep all the board seats. We're going to we're not going to relinquish that governance power and that stewardship to the people Mm. who helped grow the organization. They have other rights, um, but not necessarily those. Yeah. Right. The kind of default in a lot of these investments has been that you get both. Exactly. And so the although there are legal ways to separate them, they're not very common, um, what I find. And they it, it tends to be that like whenever I hear about this, like, yeah, we had to kind of like customize everything basically. They couldn't there was no like cookie cutter thing that they could because it's just not a popular thing. A lot of VCs actually don't accept it. Um they o- will only have it if they have like real equity, real control uh, over <laughs> over the business. Exactly. And like recognizing that uh, that problem and, you know, like I don't think Germany is so great. I just came across the fact that all of this is happening and there's so many people working on it. You know, this new entity form, like that is exactly the problem that is being addressed because we're mm-hmm. already able to separate um, the rights that various stakeholders have in an organization, but usually it costs a lot of money. You need a bunch of lawyers to write very bespoke yeah. sort of contracts and, and clauses and whatnot. And by creating a, more of a cookie cutter um, recipe, which, you know, could be a smart contract standard or whatever yeah. in our uh, in our terrain, it's a very interesting approach just to decrease transaction costs of implementing this and thereby maybe also right. facilitating the growth of these types of models. Yeah, sure. And I mean, even it's great that Germany may pass this legislation, but it means but it's only in Germany or it's only in that national context. Uh, and I think when we're talking about competing with big platforms, uh, these companies are transnational already, like their capital can go anywhere around the world whenever they want. Um, but we don't really have uh, an equivalent uh, kind of counter to that that allows for those who are working in it to kind of be able to compete with that or like to have their interests shown uh, within that type of context because there are too many like le- like labor legislation is like at a at a national level and it varies quite a lot whereas I don't know under neoliberalism like capital has been able to uh, create legislation around the world to allow it to do you know basically whatever it wants and so I think crypto is this very interesting uh, medium to where you can, like you said, reduce the transaction costs so that you can kind of, um, as soon as you have the templates, the template is there for anybody, it's the same cost. So you can choose then, do you want the the split sort of uh, economic and political power or the uh, the shared one, which you have more, um, uh, more risk of like, you know, influence sort of dominating over your business. Uh, I'm sure if those are, e- if those are equal, you have like, more uh, incentive to choose what is more difficult otherwise um, in that situation. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's an interesting... So it's not just Germany, right, that Mm. has this um, new entity form. There are other existing entity forms that, you know, organizations are exploring, for example, perpetual purpose trusts is kind of like what Patagonia did. Mm. Um, So placing sort of the the company into this trust that is bound by the purpose i think in patagonia's case it is uh, climate protection mm-hmm. right so everything that this company does it is tethered to this purpose and um and doing like tethering down purpose is interesting because it's always like in relinquishing control maybe as a startup founder this is what a lot of people also talk about you built this thing for a reason obviously you want to make money on the way but making money maybe was not the the main thing, right? And social startups have that sort of hybrid dual um, purpose of existence. So, uh, and the risk in many traditional exit models is is the fact that uh, there's always this looming purpose on the side, which is like, get rich, right? Mm-hmm. And money. And, um, and it, in many, many cases, starts to trump the original... Uh, idea, be it connecting people or uh, selling bread uh, or providing healthcare. 
And um, so this is also maybe part of my PhD research or something that we've been doing within the blockchain gov uh, is is an understanding of like when you relinquish control, be it by exiting to community through a perpetual purpose trust or transitioning towards a DAO, we are increasingly seeing um, how founding teams are trying to protect that purpose because once you give up, like you don't know where it's going to go. And broadly speaking, in my thinking, I've kind of like been identifying uh, maybe four different types along like the the less pathetic dot uh, theory of how to tailor that purpose and maintain purpose ah. of an organization through transition. Um, the first one being maybe mostly the the social norm. So this would be traditional succession or in small communities, like mm-hmm. a project that I work with in Data. If you know everybody, you trust them very very much. You trust that they will continue the purpose of this organization. So you don't have to enshrine anything in law or technology or, you know, Mm. um, do this complicated thing. You just have trust that the new stewards and owners, uh, are gonna, are gonna do, uh, the right thing. Mm. Um, obviously in many cases you don't have that trust, right? And especially if you're dropping governance tokens to thousands of people, like you don't know them. Mm-hmm. Um, so so what are other approaches? One of them could be like a legal approach, like a perpetual purpose trust or this new entity form where um, where the capital, you know, is tethered to serve a specific purpose. Foundations do that um, already. So you legally cannot uh, not go along that purpose. Um Uh, A third aspect that I think we're seeing more and more in crypto, also in terms of this governance minimization uh, approach, is to tether purpose in technology. So there's just certain things like parameters that we cannot change that are hard-coded into our protocols, and that sort of protects um, the continuous functioning of a project along its original trajectory. And then a final one that's interesting is this idea of writing a constitution, right? Which a lot of Web3 projects have been doing specifically when they transition into a DAO, like Mm -hmm. Optimism we saw launched with a constitution, Arbitrum as well, Um, you know, Safe DAO um, doing that very much uh, shortly after announcing the DAO, et cetera, um, where the constitution is this weird uh, hybrid that is both like very trust-based um, maybe a legal document. We have not seen them yet being disputed in court. And uh, to the extent that they can be enforced on chain, also a technical uh, tethering of purpose and protecting of purpose. But yeah, mm. so I think that's like a really interesting thing to consider throughout Exit that legal entities are trying to do, but we have different means maybe right. in Web3. Yeah. Do you have an example of that third one um, on hand? Like putting it into technology? the purpose in the technology is a just something for for listeners to to think about um i'm trying to think of a good example and i cannot <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> what's a bad example um, <laughs> um no so i think um part of the things like they come in 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 this idea for example in in maker dows sort of when the peg uh, like emergency situations, right. right? Who kicks in and what are the new parameters that you can now govern and vote on sort of thing that are usually shut down? Like you you can't change them. That It's just a protocol executing um, uh, certain right. things. I know like other internet also did a huge uh, research around governance of Uniswap. Mm-hmm. And there was like one of the main things uh, or like one of the insights that was in that report was around... Um, the idea and people at block science called the governance surface. So what are even like the governable areas around this protocol and within the Uniswap community, as I read it out of the, the, that report was like, um, people were like, yay, we have these governance tokens now, you know, very early sort of, um, move. And then they wondered like, what can we use them for? And realized that in terms of like changing protocol parameters, uh, it wasn't that much. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of off-chain governance maybe in proposals that you can do, but uh, right now changing protocol p- parameters, th- there's just not that much. Mm-hmm. And by not allowing too many parameters to be open to change, you're, you know, you're ensuring that that right. it's just going to continue as it's, yeah. exactly. So maybe yeah like, like in bitcoin i mean you could just say that uh, the protocol of bitcoin enshrines kind of like the the purpose of only having 21 million bitcoin or something like that yeah exactly. but as well i think there's also um 
there's probably examples of like, you know, project, I mean, there are for sure, uh, you know, just using within the protocol, like funding streams towards, you know, public goods, quote unquote, um, in the crypto space, that's, they sort of enshrined through, through code. Exactly. Uh, like, yeah. Optimisms, I think sequencer revenue, the yeah. public goods network, etc. They're yeah. just going to automatically do that. And that is part of the purpose. Yeah, and yeah. we can't change it. Hi, everyone. If you're enjoying this episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. If you're enjoying the episode or find the content I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the nearly 100 other patrons that contribute financially, which really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode and access to bonus content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. The current bonus episodes have so far explored plenty of topics, including how co-ops and DAOs relate, whether there is a socialist blockchain, a review of previous crypto events I've been to, and recently a video reaction to an episode of The Deep Program. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this episode to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. Um... And so one of the other things that you did that we uh, that I want to talk about is this recent paper on Web3 workers. Uh, so it's titled Social Security for Web3 Work, a Preliminary Specification of the Design and Deployment of Solidarity Primitives for DAO Contributors. Do um, you want to talk about that uh, a bit? Yeah, um, I want to talk about that um, by starting out that saying that I didn't do that alone. Um, So this was a research project that we did uh, with other internet um, and I worked on it for almost a year or like, yeah, like almost a year together with Laura Lotti um, and Nick Hood. Um, And essentially our... And and the the paper that you just quoted is kind of like the the final output right. uh, of of that work, which had several stages. Um, so maybe interesting to start out with what we uh, wanted to explore and why was this idea that despite there being so much talk about like you know um, unstoppable protocols and mm. autonomous code and you know uh, people being like you don't have human intervention in a true DAO, et cetera, et cetera. We're like, yeah, but um, if you look at it, it's really still people, (laughs) humans who are spending their working hours building and maintaining and growing, you know, and and using these protocols and uh, sort of saying that, especially now in a bear market, one of our key priorities as an ecosystem, if we want to survive and and matter um, and also be viewed as legitimate, is to ensure that we can maintain that talent and um, kind of prioritize building good working conditions for the people in this space, because without them, you know, um, we don't have these technologies or they don't matter. Uh, So that was kind of the starting uh, assumption that we went in with. And um, what we did then was was to explore has anybody you know written or thought about Web three as a new work environment and you know the needs and desires of these new workers or at least not new workers but workers in a new industry, um, and we did find a bunch of things um, both from industry and academia. However, what we also saw a lot of it was from the bull market. Um, a lot of it was quite quantitative or like survey based um very little of it was trying to surface like the actual like day-to-day sort of working conditions of people in the industry so we took that upon ourselves um did a thing that is called workers inquiry which is just like a research method uh, a marxist research method that you know was developed to surface insights about what's it like to work at the factory from the perspective of the worker and um, yeah, adapting, adapting that method to surface what it's like to work in Web3. Um, and then obviously our ultimate goal, as I said, starting out was not just to say, oh, work here is great or work here is shit, but to, to kind of propose um, viable mechanisms and specify them um, to argue this is what we need to do as an ecosystem to improve working conditions, to retain um, talent and, um, yeah, kind of like ensure that this whole 
uh, mad endeavor continues, but in a wholesome way. Right. Um, so, and we did that by taking our insights from that from that empirical research and uh, discussing it with a bunch of experts, including yourself. I think <laughs> along along three lines that, or like yeah. three angles that we thought or found were important to improve. That was um, psychosocial um, stability, financial security, and uh, regulatory clarity. Um, and yeah, sort of the the insights that emerged from both the research and these discussions and, you know, further specification of what is summarized uh, in this paper, which we were very much hope that others will take and, and implement. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then maybe just like, how does that... So I did that. It was not... Uh, uh, it is related to my PhD because so one section is is very much that I argue that when you transition from a founder led founder and investor led startup that is maybe incorporated as like a company somewhere, um, and you have the, all these employees that have been helping you build it that when you transition into a, a community owned and governed DAO uh, in in many cases that I research one of the key priorities should really be that the people who are working. Uh, at this organization should not be terribly worse off. Mm. Um, so yeah, and kind of like identifying, so what do we need to do was was this uh, research informing uh, my thinking there. Yeah. yeah, so just to like kind of make the connection of like this this thread that I think we're pulling on is that um, we, we, we've noticed that, of course, um, big tech has kind of um, been able to utilize kind of transnational infrastructure in order to upkeep itself and regu use regulatory arbitrage or whatever else um, in a way to uh, uh, main maintain its power. Uh, platform cooperatives are an interesting potential alternative or using exit the community to create a platform cooperative from, an from another, from a tech startup um, is an interesting kind of uh, compromise solution in order to like build an alternative infrastructure. Um, Crypto is interesting in that context because it allows for a kind of transnational form of, of coordination. Uh, but what that means, because laws are written at a national level, means that those who work in, for example, in DAOs that uh, are transnational, they don't have necessarily, because a lot of DAOs are not legally uh, um, incorporated, they don't have the kind of like worker protections that are standard for those who have like an employment contract with a company that is based in the country that they may be in. So there is this kind of, um, uh, I think what what I've seen at least is a lot of people in Web3 who do work in DAOs um, experience a lot of burnout and experience just kind of like, uh, they don't really have the same benefits as they would if they were in a, uh, in a company that was, you know, with an employment contract. Um, which can be good. I mean, for for some people, it's okay because maybe they get paid a shit ton in tokens, um, but then they are very like uh, exposed to market swings and 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 volatility. Um, but yeah, you don't have this. You don't like at least if you're in the U.S., you don't get health insurance through your DAO employer necessarily. There are of course other kinds of solutions to get to get around that. But a lot of these things that are kind of like taken for granted in an employment contract, you don't really get. And so there's, I think the question that you guys are kind of also approaching it is how do you then uh, build in maybe certain kind of like labor protection that is native to the medium that people are kind of relying on in these uh, organizations? <coughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> healthcare. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, yes, that, that is precisely sort of the, the question that we explored. Um, and we came at it and it's important in my perspective now to explore it from these various different angles. The first one being, um, so people experience a lot of burnout. Um, what can we do about it, especially if they don't have health insurance or standardized employment contracts and potentially also not a shit ton of tokens? Mm. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that we can do, I think, is prevention. Uh, and that's very much also on the psychosocial stability angle that we went in from. So this is all about building healthy norms within our ecosystem. We don't need regulatory approval to, you know, say, hey, one day a week, 
we're just gonna like not be on discord or you know and th- th- there was right. like one one idea that always ca- came up like what if we coordinated sort of uh, a proposal across our proposal where contributors just say okay here we're gonna put it to a vote like in this DAO, it's going to be a Tuesday, and this one is going to be a Sunday or a Friday or whatever. Um, we don't uh, expect anybody to reply to our messages, and and mm. it's it's not a hard enforcement. It's just something that we agree to collectively do because we think it is um, all right. Healthy. Or <laughs> you know, like we're gonna make sure to check in with like one person in the DAO once a week uh, and tell them to stop working right now or, you know, anyway, so there's all these sort of like norms that we can build um, around creating better working conditions. And we can do that either by just doing it or by putting it into DAO legislation, for example. Um, There's another aspect of uh, then maybe on the regulatory side. So when it comes to the fact that you are sick or you are burnt out, what can we built to allow you to access, uh, you know, uh, national healthcare services is uh, the interesting aspect uh, is, for example, um, previously WorkDAO and Toku or Opolis in, in the US, right? How do we build these intermediaries or interfaces that kind of allow DAO workers to do whatever they want in the Web3 space, but then, you know, kind of take care of the of the bureaucracy that needs to happen to translate whatever is happening web3 uh into something that is acknowledged and can fit into uh these people having access to to health services in various places so i think like building out services like opolis and toku uh, in a more ubiquitous uh way making them cheaper that's something that we heard that's still quite expensive for contributors to to buy into them Mm. um these interfaces i think is a is a really important thing that again we can start doing we don't need outside permission or consent and it can tremendously help people and uh simplify things it's also not a new idea you know there's been freelancers freelancer cooperatives and like freelancers banding together um to make invoicing uh, and tax payments and insurance payments easier uh, right. for a long time. So like learning from that and building that in our uh, in our space. Um, so now I've spoken about prevention, plugging into, uh, you know, uh, state-based or uh, otherwise-based uh, health services or security. Um, and the third one, I think, that, that also came out of this paper uh, is the idea of using the these technologies and tools uh, that we've created to sort of set up our own uh, uh, security systems. And here, I think what was very interesting, we spoke a bunch um, to people from the Protocol Guild, um, and they're already doing uh, something that I feel very much resembles anything that would be like Web3 native security um funds and grants in that you have a list of people uh, who have access to this part of funding. You need a mechanism to fund that part of funding, and then you need a way to spend it. And this part, these parts of funding could be a multi-sig or, you know, um, some sort of smart contract based account whose, um, who have different purposes. So one could be something like, oh, you know, when you have certified burnout, you get access, like the fund pays for your um for your therapies or yeah, I'm yeah, mm. I'm not sure right, exactly right, right. or your 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 sick leave, uh, et cetera. So it's just like an insurance part. Obviously all of these funds, like it could be parental leave, mental health, sick leave, unemployment what have you, um, all of these funds have like the same fundamental requirements is that we need a mechanism that somehow people believe is just or fair that um, specifies who gets on the list and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, So who has access to that? We need a funding mechanism, right? Like um, is this this, uh, insurance fund going to be funded by part of the income? Like a percentage of the income of the of the people who are on the list is it something like a protocol tax we i just mentioned you know the sequencer revenue for example in the public goods network or um optimism or the layer twos um is it does it come from validators does it come from there's a smart contract secured revenue i think is an interesting sort of model to explore uh so it, you know uh transaction fees from from uh, or fees collected by a smart contract um 
flow into this part anyway so you need to find out who gets on the list how does it get funded and then the last one how does it get distributed mm. right what is sort of like is there what is what do i need to prove in order to have access to how much of this this part so i'm sick and i can't work for six months yeah sort of which proofs do i need to give how do we do that in a privacy dignity preserving sort of um way um these are questions to discuss that are um that are interesting but you know not impossible and we have split contracts we have uh, multi-sigs right. we have funny money on the internet like it's <laughs> it's cool to think about these things and also think about these things in a way that ultimately like if they work um can we open them up to other people you know who also not because they work in web3 but for various reasons do not have access um to to like good uh security mechanisms and standards and right. social protection so um yeah and maybe a last one uh, that i want to mention uh that could also help if we don't have the interfaces right that was the sort of like plugging into regulatory things what um or it goes between them is an idea of like what could a standardized contributor agreement look like um you know and how do we enshrine that maybe both off chain and on chain we heard from a lot of contributors some are just contractors there's mm. some who are full time employees depending on the legal wrapper um there's some uh, who have no agreements uh, some know oh. they should be paid some are like i don't know i just did this thing maybe i'll <laughs> you know I, who knows yeah, yeah, um yeah. How do we standardize that? And is there a way, if we standardize it in a, uh, well, that uh, external regulators will recognize it, you know, as a right. as a work contract? And then, without these intermediary organizations like Opolis and Toku, can you plug into, um, I don't know, income tax schemes and uh, right, social right, security right. schemes? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's it is an interesting um, uh, problem space. I think like if if you know, Web3 wants to continue to exist. These are just like very serious problems it has to contend with, which I find, uh, yeah, sometimes the, the solutions are are uh, are far and few between. Um, but also, I also want to say uh, um, that I'm very appreciative that you guys took <laughs> my concept of solidarity primitives uh, as part of as part of the research. That was, that was a concept that I just kind of like, uh, I couldn't, I, I created for, you know, what we were building with, with bread chain as a way to kind of describe it and use just like a play on, you know, the, the use of financial primitives in, in DeFi uh, to kind of just like explicitly talk about, yeah, that in fact we are like encoding uh, something political in smart contracts that are, you know, moving real economic value to people, to places um, that have consequences that we have to, that we have to deal with. And so that was very cool to see that, uh, I suggested that. Oh concept yeah, and <laughs> no, we <laughs> loved it, and I think I think Laura brought it up first. She was like, "Let's write a white paper of solidarity primitives for <laughs> for Web three, and we were like, "Yeah, <laughs> amazing!" And then I don't know, like you know, um, obviously I've been following the Bread Chain Cooperative and all these blog posts around that very much informed the thinking. Although our take was then, uh, I think twofold, like the the term primitive. Mm -hmm. Somehow we intuitively understand it in the financial mm -hmm. uh, space, at least in Web3, that's what it feels like to me. Why is it so hard to imagine in other places mm -hmm. where it still has like some fuzzy edges on like the definition, is this a primitive, is this a mechanism, is this like, what is it? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you know the difference? Uh, I know you define it as like very underlying sort of concepts that can be implemented various ways and then also the idea is is does these are, are these just technical primitives and obviously through you know talking to yourself and others and trying to explore like what can we do realizing very fast that no um if if it's about social security and creating good working conditions these primitives need to think broader than the the right. technical realm and plug into all these other domains yeah yeah i mean i think i think the reason it's more, or part, I mean, part of the reason why it's a little bit more difficult um, is that, like, with financial primitives or DeFi primitives, like, there's always, there's already, like, an assumption, like, this is made to make money. And that's not considered, like, a social thing. It's just considered as, like, a, a fact, you know, just, like, it, it pervades everything. And so you don't have to, like, think about it so much that that's just, like, given versus uh, with the concept of solidarity primitives, like, you have to be... Because we're saying we're not 
profit oriented, it requires a caveat. It requires like a, an intentional like rejection of the behaviors that are encouraged under capitalism, I guess, is kind of how, how I see it. Um, cause then, cause there are all these projects, I mean, that, that kind of co-opt kind of progressive language or like small things that then that makes them look like they're actually really, really good people or whatever, um, that are just sort of like, I don't know, funneling money towards charities, which I mean, you know, to maybe someone who's more of a liberal listening to this, like, Oh, but isn't charity like a good thing or it's like a solidarity. Whereas I think taking the more radical approach, my feeling is that I would rather there that charity not exist. Like charity is not even a useful uh, thing in our world because we've already like, we have, we have it ingrained in our society that uh, these are not problems that we have to just like donate money to because donations is just not like a, it's not a sustainable system at all. Um, and so like by uh, ingraining it into, um, into technical code like a blockchain or a smart contract where it is it is going to uh, run no matter what you know uh, theoretically then it's it's more than just like a you can you can do things more that are not just like charitable donations um, because like the security of you know people who are workers cannot run on just donations and they don't run anywhere just based on donations they run on largely kind of like state legislation and state institutions or other types of institutions that have some sort of sustainable way to keep itself. Yeah. And that's why I think this whole, uh, I mean, in crypto called public goods funding is so like, it's so important and it's so yeah. interesting because, uh, charity is not a sustainable <laughs> right. business model. Right. And, you know, I don't know, sanctions come in, uh, interest is lost, uh, et cetera. I've been, I, you know, I have also half of my background in South Africa uh, and recently learned from people running the, uh, it's, a, it's a great initiative. It's around, uh, it's a law clinic in, um, in Johannesburg that is protecting the right to protest. So mm -hmm. they provide legal services for anybody who is protesting. South Africa has one of the highest protest rates in the world. <laughs> and anything, you know, any incident that happens during a protest, like protecting these people um, from it and providing legal services in one of the big, uh, you know, foundations. And we don't hear about these things much um, that used to support this legal uh Uh, law clinic is the Open Society Foundation, right? But Open Society Foundation recently uh, changed their mind. There was more pressing issues and they've decided to retract all of their grants from um, from South Africa, at least in that region. And this sort of project is very much dependent on being independently funded, like is part of their need and, you know, maintaining legitimacy. Uh, and I think there's a big question, and it's not just the Open Society Foundation, there's a bunch of big U.S. foundations that have decided, no, we're not going to fund this anymore, wow. um, which, you know, goes beyond charity, which sometimes I think is like the little basket that goes around church or, you know, mm. uh, and a kind gesture. Um, it's the philanthropy, which is like institutionalized charity that is just not... Um, not reliable and secure right. and uh you can't depend on just like the generosity exactly. of a billionaire so yeah exactly so uh, going beyond those models i think is so interesting and uh i love this whole idea of like hard coding it um on the other hand then you know with gitcoin and and whoever else we've seen that there's so many people who have need and rely on charity or philanthropy or mm. grants um and And uh, Gitcoin, you know, uh, used to be great and projects lived off of it. And like in the last rounds, I've heard from so many people who spend all this time and effort and energy uh, for their Gitcoin grant. And then just because there are so many people applying, right, it's a, it's a similar chunk of money that gets distributed into smaller pieces. So, yeah, um, how, how do we counter these models? Maybe again here, there's a, is an interesting overlap. Of course, uh, I think about exit to community all the time, so I see it everywhere, but, um, is really the idea of building, uh, civic or public infrastructures through, uh, 
the for-profit model uh, is something that I've been talking about a lot, especially in my working group. I'm doing this fellowship at the Weizenbaum uh, Institute in Berlin right now, um, where a lot of people in my working group are thinking about civic tech, like not in Web3, but that mm. is a, a, a topic. And uh, one of the big questions is the survival or sustainability of civic tech initiatives. Now, in many of the cases that they're looking at, it's maybe like, you know, community air uh, quality sensors or um, any any sort of grassroots movement that uses digital technologies and platforms. Many of them are grant funded. Um, they run for a few years. There's this evaluation period. Maybe there's one follow up grant or something, and then and then they stop. And then what happens there? I mean, what remains is sort of networks and ties be, be amongst the people, but the thing itself just ceases to exist. And I see, for example, Open Collective very much as an uh, opposing model to that, where the Open Collective platform is also something that many collectives, grassroots organizations, etc., rely on very much. For me, it is an open source piece of civic technology almost, but that was built... Um, not through public grants or donations, but as right. a as a business. And now there is the question of how to ensure the sustainability of this piece of civic technology, where this for business like or the the business sort of model just has way more options than if it had just you know if this had been uh, run by by a public funded or uh, donation based uh, approach. So I think that's very interesting to think about the sustainability of public goods of civic technologies of uh whatever else and that requires both building them differently maybe from the start with uh financial sustainability also in mind plus thinking about like mechanisms that go beyond uh the mm. the the whims of billionaire <laughs> right <laughs> funders yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 there's um yeah there's like uh uh, Gitcoin is nice, but clearly there's a need for, you know, more types of solutions. And Protocol Guild, I think, is one of them that is that is quite interesting. And they've been able to, I think, because they focus specifically on Ethereum core infrastructure and development, uh, which includes a lot of people who like know that that is key to the continued existence of Ethereum. That um, they've been pull off, they've been able to pull off quite. Um, some pretty pretty cool things. Um, I hope to have Trent on soon <laughs> to talk about. Yeah, it. <laughs> I look forward to listening. <laughs> um, but I think even in the Protocol Guild, right? Like the approach to funding the Protocol Guild right now is a, is a little bit setting a social norm that it is the right thing for you uh, to do. That if you're building on Ethereum and you're raising capital or you have all this revenue, you should right, right. donate. Um, you know, but these social norms can. They can change quick. exactly, especially yeah. in bear markets, especially when there's high pressure, um, yeah. and for that reason, you know, I think uh, things like yeah, the, the, I'm I'm very curious about how the public goods network and like optimism sequence of revenue, uh, et cetera, these like protocolized right. income streams, how they play out and if they matter. <laughs> right, and uh, yeah, I have yeah, and then whether or not. I mean, sometimes just like the, the of course, we've talked about this, but like um, the public goods narrative tends to be a little bit of a co-optation of like as if they're doing something good um, or something like very helpful to the to the community, but ends up being to where, for example, uh, you know, we're funding public goods, but only for if you use our product, <laughs> you know, which is not at all <laughs> than what public goods right. are. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 no. I mean, uh, I I think we agree on like this. This term is just being uh, stretched very, <laughs> very thin. I think in our community, but on the other hand, it's also it's uh, it feels like it's gone so far that you just say this public goods, and there's this association that pops up in everybody's mind, and then mm -hmm. it's very easy to move on. I think like from from my own experience of being like, right. yeah, public goods funding, and then we get into like. <laughs> Uh, the real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Um, well, it's been about an hour. So is there anything else that you wanted to um, plug or that you wanted to share with people? Nothing specifically um, for now. Uh, I I would like to reiterate to check out that white paper or the, mm -hmm. that piece that... I'll link it. Um, thank you so much that... Yeah, Nick, Laura, and myself wrote and uh, really, really encouraging and calling 
uh, people to pick up some of the suggestions. Please reach out if you have questions. But, you know, ultimately, the impact that I would love to see with this work is that people start building some it. of these primitives right. or mechanisms and, you know, working on them. That's that's something that as a Ph.D. student, it's beyond my means or uh, mm. expertise. But uh, as a Ph.D. student that hopes to graduate one day and maybe <laughs> <laughs> start working, <laughs> you know, I, I have a very keen interest. Tara's future employer. Yeah. <laughs> Listen up. <laughs> These are the mechanisms I need. Right, no. right. But yeah, no, that that would be fantastic. Like that uh, I think would be so meaningful. And it's also it's a great service and something that we also spoke about that um, it's not just cool ideas of products to put out for the Web3 space that people need, you know, like contributors have told us that they want this. Uh, I think it's also a move towards... Um, a time where this space is definitely facing a huge crisis of legitimacy yeah. across the world. And people are asking, what is the use case? What is what is the good thing that Web3 is doing? And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's hard uh, to show. But I think if we show that we have goodwill and we have mechanisms and very clear ideas of how to improve working conditions for people that are freelancers in web3 and beyond um then then that is something that like regulators and policymakers can agree with this is one of their core um tasks right so i think it's also just opening a conversation around legitimacy and being a space that cares about people that regulators also care about right mm. um so so yeah i think picking up some of the ideas in there is a is a is a business opportunity, a great service to me, and maybe also the broader ecosystem. I hope this yeah. is a hard sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I have one more question, but I know it's going to open a can of worms. Oh, no. <laughs> Should Web3 workers start a union? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Based on your, your work and research, I know you have some thoughts on it. Yeah, so I think like that it's been a really interesting question that's come up a lot, and I think one of the... the uh, the nicest thing about about it, this is the question that comes up most and mm -hmm. people are enthusiastic about it and people are like, let's start unionizing. Um, and this is something that I love uh, to have that resonance. But personally, I'm skeptical that unionization is the right way to go at the moment based on this research um, for various reasons. Like the first uh, most obvious reason is that unionization in many cases will very much depend on contributors coordinating. Uh, and they do it, right? They, they start the union. It's not going to be a company coming in and doing it for them. Uh, and coordinator, uh, contributors, like one of the key findings that we had, like they are they're overwhelmed with the amount of coordination that they're doing <laughs> all day. <laughs> they are, um, in many cases, burning out. They know people who are burning out. Placing this added burden on them to improve the working conditions is severely going to not improve working conditions, uh, I think, at least in the beginning. And it's it's just a burden. It doesn't seem like the immediate thing yeah, to yeah. do. Like, you know, there we're making things, things perhaps work. To do we're, first. Exactly. We're making things worse for, for the, the people that we're trying to make things better for. And we're also placing the burden of making their own lives better again on that same people. Whereas mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of other stakeholders... Uh, can have a lot of impact uh, before that. So so that's the first reason like let's not put everything on the on the contributors and communities organizing. Um the second thing is the idea of unions is very much the idea of workforces antagonizing their employers. Um so Amazon if it's of unionizations would be workers uniting together to antagonize Amazon the company in order to collectively bargain for better working conditions. Now, the question is that if you work for a DAO or a protocol or a smart contract or just an open source project in the ecosystem, who is that stakeholder that you're antagonizing? It becomes very, very murky. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe, uh, yeah, to close off the <laughs> this kind of worms um, and not spend too much on it, one interesting alternative idea that, you know, we've been exploring and coming across is the idea that instead of unionizing, what would a guild model for um, contributors look like? Um, and, and yeah, so, so looking more down the guild route, which is just like mm -hmm. skilled work people or like um, who see themselves as the skilled workforce um, for hire, for various services, how can they collectively use their right. power to set prices, conditions, 
um, you know, uh, engage with regulation, et cetera, uh, is, mm. is an interesting alternative approach to the unionization. So I really appreciate the enthusiasm around it and yeah. I love it in so many contexts. Art's in the right place. Uh, yeah, no, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so for it, but uh, I'm not sure it's the most impactful thing to do in mm. Web3 mm. at the moment. Meet a smart contract developers guild, community manager guild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like that as, a, as a starting point, where at least there's a, a place where people can can talk about their their working conditions in the first place. That's a yeah, as a as a stepping stone, perhaps to if it makes sense. I mean, exactly. It's just it's a different form of collective bargaining as well. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. That does not assume this uh, this employer to, for example, antagonize. Right. Yeah. Right. When you're employer is like a, an anonymous group of kind of token investors, then it's it's hard to, you, there's no central point that you can kind of attack necessarily to induce higher wages. I mean, I think or, in a lot of DAOs right now there is, but ideally there is not. <laughs> sure, so. sure, yeah, 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 yeah. that's true. Um, I think yeah. part of, I think actually if, I think if there were to be <clears throat> labor unions in Web3, it would disprove the decentralization that's an interesting question, but yeah, 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 no, for sure. Um, um, but yeah, all right. Thanks so much, Tara, for coming on. And uh, yeah, is there? An, uh, do you want to plug? I don't know your uh, your social media or anything. <laughs> Um, sure, I'm terrible <laughs> at it, but I do from time to time try to repost things on Twitter uh, at mpg underscore dd. Um, so yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. 